Okay, why don't we get started? Um, this light is not the ideal one. Do you guys prefer the light on or off? <laughs> Raise your hand if you prefer it on. Raise your hand if you prefer it off. Looks like the offs have it. All right, I just want to remind you a little bit about what we did last time. I talked to you about um, this technique that the visual system appears to be doing in terms of coding information, in terms of um, uh, a Fourier analysis, or in terms of spatial frequency. And um, this painting is a good uh, example of that, where you have uh, a painting of a woman on a vanity, at a vanity, uh, at one spatial frequency, and a picture of Abraham Lincoln uh, at another. Now, there are a couple of things that are also demonstrated by this that I want to highlight as we go on uh, in this first section of the course. There, there are two basic processes that I'll be discussing over the next three lectures. One of them I refer to as grouping. And so the idea here is um, if you think of all these blocks that get pulled together, if you squint your eyes, all this stuff sort of blurs together and you see a picture of Lincoln. Another example of that is if you're looking at me, Professor Todd standing at the front of the room, right? He's got flesh colored skin and um, a green shirt and gray hair, uh, tan slacks, all those things get merged together into a, a whole object, which is, which is me. Now, if you wanted to, right, you could focus your attention acutely on my hair, right, and say, um, you have a bad hair day today. Um, probably wouldn't say that, but uh, if you wanted to, you could pay attention to my slacks. And maybe I have a mustard stain on them or something, right? So we can, we have two processes that do the opposite thing. So one, which groups information together and, and conglomerates image features into holes, and another one that isolates particular features and ignores everything else. All right, and these two processes are referred to as grouping and attention. And so I wanna start first on grouping, and then uh, next time, I probably won't finish that today, but next time we'll finish grouping and we'll start talking about the process of attention. Both of which are absolutely fundamental for um, our normal behavior and at the very end of the class next next Tuesday I'll show you a film of uh, some patients who don't have normal attention so for example they can't attend to one side of their visual field which can be quite debilitating all right now as I said before there are a couple of ways that Dali made uh, double images so one is by painting Excuse me. Um, one is by painting um, different images at different um, uh, spatial scales. But there's another technique which I want to focus on today, which is what you see here, where you can see either the Venus de Milo um, or an image of a Toreador that can flip back and forth. Now these are not painted at different scales like the, the nude woman and the Abraham Lincoln were. Um, they're camouflaged in a different way. And uh, the other thing to notice here is this little Dalmatian dog um, that you see here. How many of you can see the dog? Raise your hand. Can anybody not see the dog? You can't see the dog? Were you here last time? No. Ah, okay. I changed everybody else's brain. Now I'll change yours. 
Um, okay, this is the snout of the dog right there. That's its ear. That's its left foreleg. That's its right foreleg. Its hind legs are back here. Can you see it yet? Well, I'm not going to spend too much time on it. Once you see it, you'll never unsee it. That's the, that's the trick. Uh, now, this is a common one. You see it in a lot of textbooks. Usually when I teach this class, more than half the people have seen it before, immediately see the Dalmatian. However, um, just, to fool the re just to fool those people, I've added this slide here, which you probably haven't seen before. Raise your hand if you can interpret this in some sensible way. What do you see? A cow. Anybody else see a cow? What do you see? I also see a cow, but not until after you said that it was a cow. All right, how about you? You raised your hand earlier. Did you see a cow also? No. <laughs> what did you see? <laughs> All right, well, let's get you all to see the cow. So this is the ear of the cow. This is the other ear of the cow. That's the muzzle of the cow. That's the eye. That's the other eye. Now how many of you can see a cow? You're better at this one than the Dalmatian. Um, now, again, the next time you see this image, you will instantly see the cow. Right, so once you get this organization, you, you have it. Right? This is uh, a great example of perceptual organization or grouping. Right? So what your brain is doing is combining these features in such a way that this global form eventually pops out and you see the, the head of a cow. All right? And so what I want to do is spend the rest of the day talking about, or not the rest of the day, but the rest of this lecture, talking about um, uh, perceptual grouping and some of its history. Now, let's go back to the early 20th century. Um, I'm forgetting what I talked about in different classes. I don't think I talked about structuralism in here. There was a movement in the United States that, um, in retrospect, is just totally bizarre. It, it's a, a, a theory called structuralism. And the idea was that when psychology was first forming, the early psychi psychologists were trying to model themselves off other scientific disciplines that were more established. And one of the approaches was by a guy named um, uh, Edward Titchener at Cornell University was called structuralism. And the idea is that uh, our mind, our concepts, uh, are made up of elementary sensations or elementary simple ideas. And so what they would do is they would get trained graduate students at Cornell University. And, um, and so this was trying to model, the basic idea is that you can think of uh, mental concepts much like you do the structures in chemistry, right? So objects are composed of molecules, molecules are composed of atoms and electrons, et cetera. And they, they were trying to think about psychology in that way. Um, and so the way they would do it is they use this technique called introspection, where they would introspect about what they were seeing and try and come up with the elementary sensations. I mean, totally bizarre idea. So bizarre, in fact, that it launched a counter movement in the field called behaviorism, which is equally ridiculous. Behaviorism denied the existence of mind altogether. Um, and that reigned supreme in America for almost, well, for 60 years uh, until it finally ran out of gas about the 1960s. There was another counter movement to structuralism, which was uh, the Gestalt approach. Gestalt is a German word that means the whole. And so what the Gestaltists are all about is that you can't break up 
complicated things into a list of simple parts and understand the complicated thing. It just doesn't work that way. And the, the maxim of Gestalt psychology was uh, uh, the whole is different from the sum of its parts. All right, and so the Gestalt psychologists were really stressing the idea that you show these elementary sensations like you know the spots on the page here and somehow the brain pieces all that together and a cow emerges somehow all right so that's the whole emerging from these parts that don't seem to have any relationship with them um, um, now as you might guess uh, the gestalt movement was primarily in germany and uh, as it turned out, they were uh, many of the researchers who were in this school were also Jewish. And so when Hitler came on the scene in, in Germany, uh, they had to get the hell out of Dodge. And a large number of them came to the United States and eventually had a fairly substantial influence here. Um, the, um, there was one famous guy who was a Gestalt, his name was Metzger, who was a member of the Nazi party and cooperated with them, and the rest of the Gestaltists hated them. And I committed a terrible faux pas one time where I was having lunch with one of the uh, old Gestalt guys, his name is Hans Wallach, and uh, I asked him about, an about an experiment that Metzger had done, and it was clear that Wallach was really pissed off at me for bringing this up, and I had absolutely no idea what I had done, and I heard after the fact that Metzger was in fact a Nazi and that uh, had gotten a bunch of the Gestalt, Jewish Gestalt psychologists arrested, and the rest of them absolutely hated his guts. Um, but. Unfortunately, it was too late for, um, uh, when, actually when I was over in Europe just this past week, I had a conversation with one of Metzger's students, uh, which was really weird, but I, I don't have the time to go into that. But, uh. <coughs> All right, so the cornerstone of Gestalt psychology is this concept of goodness or prognance. And it's, the idea is you will see the simplest possible configuration that is possible. Now, if you interviewed a thousand perceptual psychologists and you asked them if they believe in the law of prognance, I would venture to guess that all thousand of them would say, yeah, of course. The problem is, if you then ask them to define what simple is, they throw up their hands and say, I haven't a clue. <laughs> All right? So the, it's this essence that, that, that sounds like it's on target, that the Gestaltists were really onto something. They never were able to formalize it in a way that uh, you, could, you could really develop it the way that we want to develop our scientific theories. Um, so I'm going to talk today about a bunch of the Gestalt phenomena, and um, uh, there's several of them. There's grouping, there's separating figure from ground, um, they're impossible, they're um, um, implicit contours. Uh, there are a bunch of things that that we'll talk about, but I want to start with grouping. So. Who shall I pick on? Let's pick on you. Tell me what you see in the top row here. Um, black dots that are separated equally. Black dots that are what? Separated equally, like the interval in between. Um, well, that interval is not the same as that interval. As in these ones, in between groups of two. Groups of two. That's the key thing. Now, if I'd ask anybody in this room, they would have given me the, not exactly the same words but they would have said there are four groups of two in that top row. You'd also say the same thing uh, about this one or about this one. Now notice the principle by which the grouping occurs is a little bit different. 
So these group because of their proximity. These group by their color and these group by their size. But the basic notion is that what your brain is doing is it automatically says, all right, I'm gonna pull these similar things apart. This is a whole, right? So there are four groups of two. And you do this quite naturally, right? I've been teaching this course for 20 years. I've never been showing this slide the whole time. And I've never had anybody say, oh, there are uh, eight dots up there, right? They always say four groups of two. So this is a, a good example of what we mean by this automatic grouping that uh, the visual system is performing. Now, we can do things to the stimulus to make grouping occur where it doesn't, wouldn't happen ordinarily. So if you wanna highlight something in text, for example, what do you do? Right? So if they, say there's a text passage and you're showing it to a friend and there's one sentence you really want them to look at, what would you do? Highlight it. <laughs> highlight it, right? So you'd color it in. Um, and tell me all the ways you could highlight it. Um, you can underscore, you can circle it, you can strike it through with a highlighter. You could put asterisks around the beginning and the end of the sentence. All those are ways to cause grouping to occur. Right, so one of the examples you use, you could connect them with lines. Um, you could circle them. These are both ways to achieve uh, grouping where they wouldn't ordinarily be there if you didn't add this extra information. Again, but another example, so if I showed this to you, I say, what do you see? You would say four pairs of dots, each pair is designated with uh, an oval. <coughs> Now, people have done experiments on this to look at the priority of these grouping rules. So it turns out that uh, if you were using proximity, these would be grouped. Um, whereas if you group by drawing the line around them, you group these two. And it turns out that drawing the line um, has a stronger effect on grouping than putting the things close together. And uh, proximity is also overruled by connectedness, as you see in the bottom figure here. Now, one of the ways that we're studying this, this is by a, a guy at uh, um, UC Berkeley uh, named Steve Palmer, uh, invented one of the uh, a really nice psychophysical technique for looking at grouping. And so what he does, it's a simple experiment. You, the task is to detect repetition of a shape in a sequence. So if you look here, right, you have a circle, square, circle, square, circle, circle, square, circle. So there's a repetition right here. As opposed to in this one, you have circle, square, circle, square, circle, square, square, circle. There's a repetition there. Uh, this one has no repetitions. Oh, yeah, it does right there. Um, anyway, so the, the task is you, you have to detect repetition of a, a, a target. And it turns out that if the repetition is within a group, uh, like right here, right? You, they're being grouped by proximity, right? You're able to detect this repetition significantly faster then you can detect the one down here where the two items are in different groups. All right, so here you can get really uh, objective criteria using this reaction, type, reaction time technique to evaluate um, the effect of any given source of grouping. And you can nest these things, so responses are faster than the repetition is grouped by the smaller ovals, this one, and if they're grouped by the bigger ovals here. And there's a whole cottage industry of research on this stuff. I'm, I'm just giving you a flavor of what it's like. Now, one of the things about this particular lecture is that, uh, as I said, I've been teaching this course for a while, and uh, I often get ex-students send me materials. And this particular lecture is loaded with them. 
Uh, it turns out there's an ad campaign by um, uh, this company, um, Absolute is a kind of vodka. Um, and I, I don't know what the hell Citron is. I think it's like a citrus flavored vodka. Sounds disgusting, but. Um, <laughs> but in any event, they sell it. And um, somebody who was on the Absolute marketing team had obviously taken a course in Gestalt, where they covered Gestalt psychology. Um, we'll see a lot of them in the course today. So here we have Absolute Boston, and uh, they've got all these uh, boxes of tea um, that are arranged in the shape of an Absolute vodka bottle. This is grouping by what? Proximity. Um, or on the beach, we have this row of tents, uh, which is in the shape of an absolute vodka bottle. This is grouping by color, all right? And th there are many other flavors of this. All right, now we get to my favorite part of Gestalt psychology, which is the distinction between figure and ground. This is really, really, really an important aspect of our visual perception. We do it really early in the processing stage. Um, so the idea is what is in front is the figure and what's behind is the ground. So if you're looking at me, right, all the parts of my body, my hair, my face, my clothes, they form a figural whole. And the stuff behind me, the blackboard, the screen, is the, is the ground. All right, so there's this, there's this fundamental um, separation that your brain does. So when I look at you, your figure pops out and it's separate from all the other stuff that surrounds you. Um, and so for example here, uh, one of the ways people study this is looking at ambiguous figure or ground. Uh, so you could see the dark region is in front or you could see the white region as in front. Um, so if this is the figure, so typically the way that they would do that is that, so I think the dark region here is a horse and I don't know, the light figure is a dragon. You could ask the subjects what they see and see which one is, um, is primary. Turns out you can do this a little bit quicker if you have a recognizable figure, like a horse in this case, and um, your performance is best if the horse is at an orientation that you're familiar with seeing horses. So you're faster at pulling out the black region in this case than you are in that case. Now probably the most famous figure ground figure of all time is this one. This is uh, concocted by a Danish Gestalt psychologist, a guy named uh, Edgar Rubin. Uh, and so the idea here, how many of you see a vase? Raise your hand. How many of you see two faces? Raise your hand. Um, so I, many of your hands went up for both, but it's hard to see them at the same time. You can either focus on the vase or you can focus on the two faces. And um, now, interesting story behind this figure here. This is a real vase. Um, and just to put this in some context, when uh, professors retire, there's a tradition, probably from German, because it's called a Festschrift. And what happens is that the close colleagues and students of the professor we'll get together and have a meeting where, you know, everybody gives talks and uh, tells stories about the retiring professor. And so when Edgar Rubin had his Feshrift in the, sometime in the 1960s, uh, his students got together and commissioned this vase to be made, uh, which is a real instantiation of his, of his famous figure here. Um, I'm sure he was, I'm sure that was the best present he could have possibly received at, at his retirement celebration. 
Now, the other guy who was really into this was uh, M.C. Escher. If any of you should come to my office, you will see this uh, drawing prominently hanging, not the original, of course. Uh, but um, this is my favorite example of figure and ground. Escher was very much into Gestalt psychology. He was also really into tiling. All right, so you'll see, uh, if, you, if you see an exhibit of Escher's, uh, there are a lot, lot of his drawings and paintings um, involve tilings of various sorts. And here's one where you have, um, uh, if you look in the central region here, it's sort of a tiling where you have this white human-like figure and this black sort of non-human-like figure um, that are figure ground. So you can either attend to the black or you can attend to the white. Uh, and each one is equally likely to be figure or ground. But then, as they go away, right, he emphasizes the white on this side and the black on this side. Uh, so figure and ground separate and they shake hands in the foreground. Um, here's another example of Escher, again, exploiting the tiling. Um, this time it's fish and birds. So if you look in the center here, you see the black birds and the white fish, and they're sort of equally prominent in the center, but as you go up, uh, the birds dominate, and as you go down, the fish dominate. All right, so again, it's Escher playing with this notion of figure and ground and how you can emphasize one as figure, emphasize the other as figure. You'll notice a lot of the same characters in my artistic slides that I show you. This is also a painting by Salvador Dali. Uh, let's pick on you in your green shirt. Tell me what you see here. A woman? You see anything else? How many of you see the woman? All right, now I'm gonna test your art knowledge. Can anybody recognize that woman? Remember what Dolly does. Dolly plays games with previous famous artworks, which he embeds in his own. And this one, he's playing a game with two such artworks. Um, so when I first saw this, I immediately recognized the woman as a play on, there's a, fair, a very famous painting by uh, uh, Johann Vermeer of a woman reading a letter. Um, and when I saw the man, right, uh, I thought it was a self-portrait of Dolly, but it turns out I was wrong on that. So if you look at the two that he's playing on, there is, uh, this is the famous Vermeer painting. Notice the map. The pose is she's holding the leather, the letter, um, this metal bar below the map. There's the metal bar below the map. There's the map. She has the same pose reason, reading the letter. So he's really playing off that Vermeer. And the other thing he's playing off is this is a self-portrait of Diego Velazquez, who was a, another famous Spanish painter that was very influential for um, uh, Salvador Dali, right? So this is not a self-portrait. Uh, it's the it's the portrait of uh, um, Velasquez. Uh, now the ambiguity in this is a bit different. It's because of the ambiguity of figure and ground. So you can see the figure as the woman, right? And all this stuff is in the background, or you can see the face, this is the nose, that's the beard, right? And then the woman is part of the background, all right? So you can see the, the, the face as the figure, or you can see the woman. Yeah? I'm sorry. Um, if she's, I mean, she's part of the face, right? So yeah, you're right. She's part of the face. But it, her, her features blend into the face. They... Right. They lose their distinction when you see the face. Well, like his face is part of the ground when it's just 
when it's just her. That's a good, that's, that's correct. That's correct. But this is a good example of um, what you pull out as the figure. Now this is an example where both grouping and attention work together. Because you can attend to one by say, look at the face, you can see the face. Or I can say, look at the woman reading a letter and you see the woman reading the letter, right? So you're both attending and grouping at the same time. And we'll see more examples of that as we go along. Um, so again, this is the self-portrait of Velasquez. This is the Johannes Vermeer. Um, Vermeer is a really interesting artist. The, uh, uh, there's a lot of debate about whether he cheated or not in doing these things. There's a movie that was produced by uh, Penn Jillette called Tim's Vermeer uh, of a guy who worked for Apple, wanted to recreate a Vermeer painting, he had no artistic training at all and was able to pull it off. I'll, I'll tell you a little about that uh, a little later in the course when we, uh, we do some history of art. Here's some other examples of figure and ground that have the same property that, that you met. Uh, tell me what you see. Let's pick on you this time. What do you see here? A uh, young lady. A young lady? Can you see a hag? Yeah. <laughs> How many of you have seen this one before? Who hasn't seen it before? Okay, we'll pick on you. What do you see here? A uh, young woman. Can you see the hag? No, I can't see the hag. All right, I'm going to change your brain. Yeah. All right, you think this is the the chin of the young woman? It's not, it's the nose of the hag. Uh -oh. And this is her mouth and that's her chin. Now can you see her? Yep. All right, so again, another example of uh, figure ground. And just like you pointed out before, this is not where they completely separate, right? It's the features of one take on a different meaning when you see the other. This one is older, from 1880. This looks totally creepy to me. <laughs> I should take this. I'm not going to do this course anymore, so I don't have to worry about it. But every time I do it, I say, I should get rid of that thing. That's just too creepy. Let's pick on you this time. What do you see here? Um, well, she's not standing on anything, right? She's hovering in the air. Is that really what's going on here? You could actually create this scene. There's nothing uh, impossible or imaginary. Um, right, so this is actually, we've got a curtain that forms this boundary here. And when you see the young woman, right, you're seeing this region as the figure and this curtain as the ground. And then you've got this potted plant here that you interpret as her hair. You've got this cat, this is just all empty background in that region. You've got the cat that's defining her arm and armpit you have a very strategically placed wine glass. <laughs> Anybody seen that Australian um, advertisement they took off the air where a woman just, uh, I'm not gonna go into it, I'll get myself <laughs> in trouble. Um, and then you have these stockings hanging down. Um, now, there's a, there's a principle that I'll tell you about uh, a little later in the course, um, which is the idea, well, actually a little later in this lecture, the idea that if you have this continuous contour, like here and down around there, your brain will not consider the possibility that this is not one thing, right? That this is actually a background that ends and then these stockings are hanging here and that these two regions have nothing to do with one another. So this is a powerful source of information that leads to a whole lot of different illusions that we'll see uh, throughout the course. Again, but this is an example of um, figure ground. 
All right, I'm going to pick on you this time. I want you to tell me what you see. What did you see? I'll give it to you again. I skipped past the slide. What did you see in the slide I skipped past? Okay, I'll do it again. A man riding a horse? Yeah. Was there anything weird about it? Uh, just looked like, like uh, there's like a tree or something like right in the middle of the like the uh, Okay, let's look at it more carefully. All right, this is absolutely impossible scene. That um you know, you got this is in front of the horse, all the order relations just don't make any sense at all. If you see it really quickly, you don't notice there's anything bizarre. Uh, similarly, by the way, if I showed you this quick picture really quickly, all of you would have said, oh, it's a woman, totally, nothing strange about that at all. Um, but this is an example that shows how grouping can happen really quickly and is not necessarily uh, you can have conflicting details in the grouping and you'll still group it together. Back to absolute vodka. Both of these sent by a student. You'll notice one of the things that the absolute vodka commercials do is they celebrate some particular location like absolute Malta. Like just to show they drink absolute vodka in Malta. Um, so this is an arch in Malta, and somebody photoshopped out the top there. So this looks like a bottle of absolute vodka, and uh, that makes this appear as the figure, and this appear as the ground, whereas if you filled that in with stonework, you'd see it the other way. Um, absolute anchor, anchor what? Again, somebody photoshopped a figure. I don't think the arches in Anger Watt are shaped like absolute vodka bottles, <laughs> but the, uh, you can do that with the wonders of Photoshop. Um, again, some, something, somebody on their marketing team is obsessed with Gestalt psychology. All right, this brings us to good continuation, which let me back off a second. This is the notion I described here, is that the idea that this curve um, continues as one long uninterrupted thing, uh, they're all part of the same object. This is the phenomenon of good continuation. It's a very powerful source of grouping. Um, So the idea here is that if you see this picture, um, if you ask subjects to describe it, they'll tell you you got two sort of S-shaped squiggles like so, and they won't ever tell you that they see this. So this is good prognance. This is not so good prognance. But again, scare quotes should go up when I say that because I've never formally defined what prognance is. It's the simplest figure, but that demands that you define what simplicity is, and that has remained elusive since the Gestalt psychologists first started doing this stuff. Who haven't I picked on for a while? Let's pick on you. Can you see a four in there? Um, no, I see an R and a three. You see an R and a three. Can any of you see a four? Raise your hand. Let me give you the pointer, point out the four to us. It's that top button there. Okay, how many fours can you see? Probably a lot. <laughs> All right, so let's highlight it. All right, so there's a four there, but there's, there's probably 20 or 30 in here. Uh, this is the principle that many animals use for camouflage, right? You wouldn't ordinarily see the four. Why not? In order to see the four, you need to see this line terminate from that. And what good continuation says is, no, I'm going to see this as one continuous unit, one continuous unit. 
So if I want to camouflage the four, what do you do? You take the contours and extend them. And that makes it more difficult to see. And so here are some examples. This is totally hokey. I should take this out of my lecture too. Um, this is not a background that the leopard, I'm sorry, the zebra did not evolve its stripes for camouflage, though in principle it could use camouflage if it was in a striped environment. On the other hand, uh, this toad is a natural adaptation uh, where it blends perfectly with the texture in the background. All right, so this is a very effective t technique. A predator is not going to eat you if it can't see you. And so uh, a lot of animals have evolved structures uh, that exploit things like good continuation to camouflage themselves uh, with respect to the background. Here's another interesting example. Uh, you've got a well-formed triangle here, but it's impossible to see it, right? You just simply can't see this line right there as being part of these two. You see it as part of the overall pattern. Um, that I've shown there. All right, let's consider another principle of Gestalt psychology, what they call um, amodal completion. Um, let's pick on, let's pick on you over here. Tell me what you see here. Um, red square covering a black circle. Red square covering a black circle. Would anybody have described this any differently? You all would describe it as a red square. Now, maybe you're too young. Have all of you familiar with the game Pac-Man? <laughs> all right. So you could have said it's a red square adjacent to a Pac-Man figure, but you didn't. All right. So somehow your brain decided that this isn't a Pac-Man figure, it's actually a circle that's occluded by the red square, right? So what you see is this instead of that, or, and certainly not that, which is also a possible interpretation of what this could be. Um, so this is called amodal completion, and the interesting thing about amodal com completion is that Everybody sees this as a circle, but at the same time, they're well aware that they can't see the hidden parts, right? So they know, I, I can't see this part back here, but I know it's there, right? We're gonna distinguish that from modal completion, which I'll tell you about a little later, where you actually see a figure that isn't there. Um, but this is amodal completion. And there are a number of ways to study this. Um, typically the way they do is they'll show subjects patterns like this, and then they tell them to draw what's behind the square. And so typical responses look something like that. In this case, they, they draw an arc. In this case, they draw a straight line. In this case, they fill in the corner like so. Um, so these are the most frequent completions for that. And so this is a very simple technique by which you can study um, amodal completion. And then you get some weird effects like this. This is sort of a combination of amodal completion with good continuation. Um, who haven't I picked on? Far back corner. What do you see here? Do you see a really long horse or two normal horses? How many of you see a really long horse? How many of you see two normal horses? That's um, eh, pretty split. Um, so if you see a really long horse, right, what you're doing is you're taking this contour and linking it up to the one over here. And your brain is saying that fills in. I call that the limousine horse. <laughs> um, 
Now there's plenty of information that's telling you, since all the other horses are exactly the same size and shape, that this really ought to be two. So the fact that you can see this is one, uh, again, is testament to the power of um, amodal completion and good continuation. That brings us to modal completion, or what's sometimes referred to as emergent features. Let's pick on you again. What do you see here? Um, I see kind of like a curve in the middle of the two series of lines. So do you see an actual line here? Kind of, yeah. yeah. Right? But there isn't a line there. Right, this is called um, illusory contour, because you see a contour, but there isn't one. Now actually, I'll try to give you an explanation of this to try and show that this really does make sense. So this is a good example of uh, subjective contour or modal completion. Here's the most famous example. Uh, so this is from a guy at um, uh, University of Trieste in Italy. His name is uh, um, Canizza. I actually met one time years ago. And um, how many of you see a white triangle in the center here? Why do you see a white triangle? Now, let me ask you another question. Does the white triangle seem whiter than the background? So white triangles seem whiter than the background to you? Yeah. Why would you expect to see that? All right, the key ecological principle that's driving this is the effects of occlusion. So um, can I borrow your notebook for one second? So if you see, whoops, I got to do it that way. If you see this pattern right here, and my arm just comes to an end and stops to be replaced by the notebook. Now, what's likely to cause that in the natural environment? The notebook is occluding the rest of my arm. All right, so the key source of information that tells you about occlusion are contour terminators. The idea that this line just stops there, and this line just stops there, and this line just stops there, and stops there, and this line just stops there. Right, so whenever you see occlusions like that, your brain is really sensitive to it at a fairly early level of processing that says, hey, th these ends just aren't happening uh, by accident. They're happening because there has to be an object here that occludes it. And in this case, your brain actually fills in and builds these contours. And that's what's called um, an illusory contour because it's not really there. And again, the other interesting thing is that the region here is brighter appears brighter than the region out there. Uh, here's another example from, I don't know why l liquor manufacturers are into Gestalt psychology so much. This is not um, absolute vodka, it's Chivas Regal. Uh, but again, you get the illusory contour of the rest of the bottle um, with the cute caption disappears rather quickly because uh, not in my house, I hate scotch. <laughs> but uh, all right, what I'm going to try to do now is give you an explanation of why that happens and some of the history of how it was discovered. And um, the um, the explanation is based on some studies that were done by a Russian researcher by, uh, named Yarbis, 
who was playing around with uh, stabilized images in the uh, 1950s. Now, I'm not exactly sure how he did this. I think he had some kind of contact lens he could put on the eye, and then the contact lens would change the image. With eye so when you move your eyes, nothing would change. Uh, so usually if I go from looking at you to looking at you, right, the center of my visual field was you, and now it's you. But if you were in Ar Yarbis's apparatus, if I'm looking at you and then I move my eyes, you're still in the center of my visual field. And Yarbis reported this interesting phenomenon. So basically, uh, what he did is what this device does is it stabilizes the retinal image. So when you move your eyes, nothing changes on the retina. And what he report, what people report when I've never experienced this myself, so. I'm giving you secondhand reports, but what people report is, let's say I'm looking at the class and I have a stabilized retinal image, uh, all of a sudden you would disappear. And then you would disappear. And then you would disappear. And eventually the whole class would vanish and you see nothing, just, just, a, just a blur. So the idea is in order to see figures, you need some movement on the back of the retina. If you stabilize the, the retina, uh, stabilize the image on the retina, it goes away. Now, Arbib did one really interesting experiment that I'll tell you about now. So he started out with a retina, retinally stabilized red circle, right? So the red circle is going to be stabilized on the retina. These contours are going to go away. And then after looking at this for a while, that red circle is going to disappear. Now the question is, what takes its place? Now these contours are not stabilized. So you're going to see the green square here all the time. But this contour is stabilized and this circle will disappear. So you've got a couple of options here. One is, you could see the internal part, once it's stabilized, as being green, or you could see it as gray. I mean, you don't really know. And what observers report is that it does something like that. Now, this is not a good depiction of what they report, because what they report is, is that green tends to flow into the circle almost like it's fluid. Right? So it just doesn't come in all at once. It flows in from the edges. And it really looks like the color is flowing. Um, and so you see homogeneous green. So this gives us a hint about what may be forming those uh, subjective contours. So the idea here is that uh, when I look at this initially, I've got this green contour here, which is telling me that everything in the center is green, and a green contour here, which is telling me everything on the outside is green, and I've got this red contour in the center, which is telling me everything on the inside is red. All right, when that stabilizes that red contour, then, um, when the red contour is there by itself, right, the color flows from the contour inside the region. But if I stabilize it, then the green flows in and this becomes homogeneous green. Now, why would we have such a weird process like that? Well, there's a good reason for it. One is, how many of you have ever seen a picture of the back of your eye? Right, when you go to the optometrist, does he or she take a picture of your eye? I think so, yeah. And do they show it to you? Nope. Anybody looked at the pictures they take? What does it look like? It's red and green in the back. It looks like, um, I don't know. Do you see a bunch of veins? Oh, yeah. Yeah, coming out of the nerve. So here's the question I have for you. Right, if you look in the eyeball in front of the retina, there's a very dense network of veins. Why don't you see them? Uh, 
They're there. Filter it out. I'm sorry? Do we filter it out? Uh, how would you filter it out? They're stabilized. All right, now the veins are stabilized because when you move your eye, the aim, the, the veins move with it. And so what that means is that the veins are going to behave just like that circle in Yarbis's experiment, right? Because they're stabilized, they never change with eye movements. They just sort of disappear, right? But now, if that's going to be the case, what do you put in their place? So you fill in with what else is going on in the background. All right, so again, this is a really basic mechanism. You also have a blind spot in the back of your eye, about the size of your thumb. Do you see a hole in your visual field when you're looking around? Why not? The blind spot is stabilized. That means that contour is gonna disappear because it's not changing with your eye movements. There are some people who have really large legions in their visual cortex, you know, might be half the visual field, where they're not getting any sensory inputs. And get, that's called a scotoma. And those people often are unaware of it unless they're tested. Right? It's half their, half their visual field is gone, just like your blind spot is, right? But your brain fills it in and it looks like a normal environment to you. All right, so this is important if, we, if you don't wanna be focusing on your retinal veins all the time, you need a mechanism like this to, um, to filter that out as one of, one of you said earlier. But it's, a, it's not a normal kind of filtering, it's a very nonlinear. Um, so it turns out there is a theory, um, here's another example of this by the way. Um, this is what's called neon color spreading. And how many of you see a tinge of red in the center here? All right, actually the, this color and that color are exactly the same. And the reason why you're seeing this is because, right, these terminators are telling you there's a circular occlusion there and these colors are flowing in to say that these, these regions are tinted a little bit red. Here's another example of that. So you notice here, it looks a little bluer than that does. This one looks a little tealer than that does. Um, again, good examples of uh, this color spreading, uh, which, uh, So the theory of how this works comes from uh, Steve Grossberg and Enyo Mangola um, in 1985. Uh, Enyo was my first graduate student, so I'm quite proud of his work. Um, Steve is a, uh, one of the leading researchers in neural networks. Uh, and these hypotheses were based on primarily on Yarbis's experiments and this sort of imagining how you would deal with things like retinal veins. And so the idea is if the flow of color signals is necessary to fill over fixed structures in the visual field, such as veins and the blind spot, right? So the idea is you're gonna have color flow from non-fixed contours into open regions and that's what's gonna prevent you from seeing the veins or the blind spot you got to have a mechanism to stop the flow. And so what he suggested is that um, there are two systems. One he called a feature contour system, where color flows in all directions away from non-stabilized contours, and a boundary contour system that creates the barriers that contain the flows of the color signals. Um, now this is really a pretty simple idea. You wouldn't think so if you read the paper, which is just filled to the brim with differential equations, but the, the basic idea is fairly easy to explain. So um, let me try to do that for you. So let's suppose you've got these three lines that you're being stimulated with. 
right? What's happening here? Terminator, right? Terminator, Terminator. What does a Terminator tell you? There's an occlusion, right? These didn't happen by themselves. There's probably some object like this that's occluding these lines. Similarly, we have Terminator, Terminator, Terminator. Now, the way the brain reacts to that, and we actually have uh, people have gone in and looked at single cells, so this really happens inside the cortex, right? What these terminators do is they activate cells which are oriented perpendicular to the lines that are terminating. All right, so this starts a pattern of activity in the brain where you have horizontally oriented cell, cells with horizontally oriented receptive fields that start getting activated by these terminators. Um, this is the boundary contour system. Then colors are allowed to flow inside this bounded region. If you didn't create these boundaries, the color would just flow outside and, you know, everything would just be, uh, you know, it's like you pour paint, different colors of paint on a canvas, it would just smoosh all over the place. If you allow color to flow, you have to have ways of blocking its flow. And that's what the feature contour system does. So let's see how we can explain the Kinitsa figure uh, using this principle. Uh, where are our terminators? Here, 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 here. All right, so what's that telling me? There must be something here that's occluding this thing. There must be something here that's occluding this thing, right? Those cells then fire, get activated, and uh, that creates boundary contours here and here. And then once the color starts to flow, right, you have from this high contrast region here, when this white flows into the center, that makes this a little bit brighter than the region on the outside. Here's another example. Again, all these terminators, all these terminators sets off these strong illusory contours. All right, now let's see if somebody can, what time does this class stop, by the way? I'm sorry? 2.40. 2.40, okay, good. Um, so everybody see a strong illusory contour here? Now which, is, which gives you a better illusory contour, this figure or that one? The first one? Or the second one? First one gives you stronger. Well, why is that? Well, notice what we did here is we actually drew part of the contours in. This isn't a terminator anymore, right? It's a closed figure, which is going to activate those neurons a little bit less, which means you don't get that illusory figure as you, as you do here. All right, so this is a great example of how, uh, at least in some of these cases, you can uh, take Gestalt phenomena, in some respects the most perplexing one, the illusory contours, and actually make sense of it. So the way this worked historically is uh, Grossberg and Magola were motivated by Jarvis's experiments with the color spreading and fixed retinal images, right? They then posited, um, whoops, I didn't want that. They then posited these two systems, the feature contour system and the boundary contour system. Um, and um, once they did that, then neurophysiologists went in and actually were able to measure this behavior in single cell units in the monkey visual cortex. All right, so it's, it's the kind of progression, right? One experiment sets off a hypothesis um, for a theory, and then the neurophysiologist can go in and say, well, all right, are these things really there? And lo and behold, they are.
All right, let me get to one last aspect. I'm not going to finish this today, but I'll get into it a little bit. Of, um, it turns out that the very first Gestalt, so I've talked about several Gestalt phenomena. I've talked about grouping. I've talked about figure ground. I've talked about modal completion. I've talked about amodal completion. Um, but the very first phenomena in Gestalt psychology was one that you see here and it's called apparent motion, and it was discovered by um, the sort of father of Gestalt psychology, a, a guy named Max Wertheimer. And this is a picture of a young Max Wertheimer, and um, let's pick on you. Tell me what you see here. Um, the figure just moved from left to right and right to left. But you see it move. Is it really moving? I think so. <laughs> Do you see it move? Yeah. When you watch a movie, is there any motion in the movie? How does a movie work? Um, well, like old movies, didn't they like flip their stuff to make like, Right, so you see a picture. And then that picture disappears and another picture comes on. Yeah. And that one disappears and another picture comes on. But nothing actually moves. You're just seeing a sequence of still images. And that's what's happening here. All right? So when Max is to the left, that picture disappears. And it reappears over to the right. But it never moves through the center sections. You see it do that but it's not happening physically. That's why this is called apparent motion. And this totally freaked out the Gestalt psychologists. They were absolutely mesmerized by this. This is the phenomenon that launched Gestalt psychology. Now, just to give you um, some nomenclature here, here's the basic idea. You have an image in frame one a blank interval, and then an image in frame two. And there are a couple of time timing events that we can uh, specify. So one is the time between the offset of frame one and the onset of frame two is called the inner stimulus interval, or the ISI. And then you have another thing called the, on, the time between the onset of frame one and the onset of frame two, which is called the stimulus onset asynchrony, or SOA. And then the third parameter is how far you shift the image in frame one to the image in frame two. Now, just to give you a little background, remember I said the early psychologist tried to fashion themselves after other physical sciences. And um, just like the structuralists tried to model chemistry, so did the early Gestalt psychologists, though it was a different aspect of chemistry. How many of you have taken chemistry before? All right, and um, if I ask you about what are the different phases of matter? Anybody want to volunteer that? Yeah. And how do you move from one phase to a different phase? Um, change the speed of the molecules. How do you do that? Energy. Energy. Uh, how do you do that? You change the temperature or the pressure. Yeah. All right. And so what they would, uh, when you took chemistry, you undoubtedly had a figure called a phase graph where you had pressure on one axis and temperature on another axis, and then you'd have these regions marked in ice, water, steam, right? Actually, I think there's like eight kinds of ice, but who's counting? Uh, the important thing is by varying a set of parameters, um, you could vary um, the state of matter from solid, liquid to gas. Now it turns out that apparent motion has some similarities to that, which was well known to the Gestalt psychologists. So uh, depending on how you do these parameters, you can get something that looks like that. What do you see? Um, 
seems like two dots flashing at the same time. You see two dots flashing at the same time. Um, what do you see now if I make the intervals a little bit longer? Now it seems like one dot moving back and forth. After. Okay, and now we'll make the intervals a bit longer still. What do you see? One dot moving back and forth, but just slower. Oh, you still see the motion? But, yeah, but a little bit. But like I know it's just flashing. <laughs> Okay, well, I didn't make it long enough. If I made it really long, right, I had one dot up for five minutes and then it was replaced by another one for five <laughs> minutes, uh, you would no longer see motion. You'd see what's called succession. All right? So these are the different phases of apparent motion. And just like the phase diagrams that you looked at when you saw in chemistry, uh, when you took chemistry, you can get similar things when you look at uh, apparent motion. So if you have ISI on one axis and displacement on the other, right, this is a region where you'll see simultaneity. This is a region where you'll see apparent motion. This is the region where you'll see succession. All right, and it's because of apparent motion that we're able to see television, movies, streaming videos, right? All of this is based on this apparent motion phenomenon. So if, if we didn't see apparent motion, none of those technologies would work correctly. Now, you can play games with apparent motion. Yeah? So would succession look like two dots or one dot? Uh, so uh, succession is, see it here, mm -hmm. and then you see one here. But you don't see any motion. It's just you see a thing appears here, and then a thing appears here, which is what's happening in all those displays physically. But in one case, you see it um, as moving, mm -hmm. and then if you make the inner, if it's isolate really rapidly, like a millisecond per, right, you see the two things uh, flickering at the same time. Mm -hmm. So people have played all kinds of games. So, so what if you had? Um, a circle changing to, black circle changing to a red square. Uh, you can see apparent motion in this just fine. Uh, or you could have a grandmother changing into a monkey. Uh, again, you get perfectly good apparent motion. Um, now, one of the kinds of research they did involved correspondence. And all the examples I've showed you just far, they're just one target in each frame, but what if you had multiple targets? How does one, how do you know which object to hook up with what other object? And that gets you to things like this. How many of you see the dots moving up and down? Raise your hand. How many of you see the dots moving horizontally? Raise your hand. Oh, we got some, oh, now you see it. All right, so those of you who, so most of you can't see it horizontally. I can change that. We'll, right, now can you see it horizontally? Still can't do it? Well, let's make it even weird. Let's see if I can get you to see it moving in a circle. Um. <laughs> All right. <laughs> So there are all kinds of weird when you have multiple targets present. And in the in AI research, this is one of both in stereo and in motion, one of the real problems if you have a sequence of images, how do you know which feature in one image corresponds to which feature in the next? And the, the brain uh, faces that as well. Um, so you can bias it one way or another. So if I make the horizontal path shorter, you'll see horizontal. If you make the vertical one shorter, you'll see vertical. Um, the color one has only a slight bias here for horizontal. Shape has only a slight bias for horizontal. And here's an interesting, actually let me postpone this for next time. Uh, I'll let you go now. I'll finish up uh, apparent motion next time and then we'll start talking about uh, visual attention.